All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and also go down into the description, click on the link and sign up for my Patreon. Uh, helps the channel and you get to ask questions of the guests and see the interviews before anybody else. Today's guest, you might know him from Dio or Black Sabbath, currently last in line. He's got so many things going on, including his uh, weekly show on Facebook, Behind the Kit. It's a really great streaming interactive show uh, for drummers and non-drummers as well. Vinny Apice is here. We'll talk to him right after this. I wanted to thank you for being here. And as I was saying to you before, I know you do so many of these that sometimes uh, you might get a little tired telling the same stories. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, but, you know, people want to hear, you know, the cool stories. So luckily I, I got stories. That, yeah, well, that's one thing. Stories you got. But I think you also, because you do so many of the fantasy camps and you teach so much uh, online as well, every Tuesday behind the kit on yeah. Facebook, which is your streaming um, Q&A show. Uh, I think that you realize that the audience is getting younger and younger, especially for uh, this kind of, uh, of music. Rock and roll is sort of reaching a, this new young audience, and they aren't familiar with all of these stories. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, as, as the years go by, the audience, uh, we're getting younger people tuning into that show or any of the shows I play with, uh, you know, I play with last in line now and I do shows with my brother Carmine and there's uh, it's great because there's really young kids coming to the shows and they, they're into the classic uh, heavy metal rock, whatever you want to call it. So it's, it's really cool to see that happen, you know, and of course they're there with their father mm -hmm. <laughs> who's, you know, my age or, or, or a tiny bit younger, but uh, this music has definitely lasted. Uh, it, it became timeless, you know. Who would have thought? You know, I love seeing you play. I've seen you at the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camps before. I love seeing you play on the little basic kit, sit down <laughs> with some people of all ages and, and all musical abilities, and you play a song like Rainbow in the Dark. Uh, you know, you, you've, you've got fills for days. It doesn't matter what the kid is. You're playing is, is, is so fun to uh, watch. And I think it really, you. You, you see these people's eyes light up because the, I, I think for a non-drummer, the great sign of, a, of, of appreciation for a drummer is that you can sing the drum parts uh, in your head. And there's only so many people that, that, they, that can have that. And with so much of your music, uh, your parts, you come in just as much as a guitar solo or a riff. We, we know those parts. People, people have been air drumming your music <laughs> uh, uh, for ages and, and obviously will continue to because fortunately you've been a part of such um, timeless music. Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's, uh, <clears throat> you know, sometimes it's, it's like, it's the, I don't know if it's an aura or something about, certain musicians like i could get on this kit and it sounds like me i'll bring i'll always have a drum key like at the fantasy camps you never know where you're going to be playing so i always bring a key quickly do a quick tune up and then i'll play and it sounds like me i play with the butt end of the sticks and and then you get somebody else coming on the kit and it doesn't sound the same same with guitar players you know it's it's almost in your hands yes sound, you know what i mean um, best your guitar personality. players, best guitar players I've seen. I tell people it's in their hands. They can yeah. play almost any guitar through any rig, and there is still a feel they have. And that is absolutely true with your drumming. And and it's true. Most people they hand you their sticks, and they think you're going to play it, uh, you know, the normal way, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But you play well, like you said with the butt end of the stick. With the butt end, and then they they uh, how can you play with the butt end? And and I'll turn the stick around, and I'll point to the the tip, the bead. I said, this is for girls. <laughs> and they start laughing. Mm -hmm. It's just a joke, but it's a good joke. Yeah, yeah it, so it is. Absolutely. Drummers, uh, it's great drummers that play with the tip. So this just, 
performance. Of course, yeah. And you, you are, you're a patient guy. I think that's why you're so good at those things. I think uh, you, you, you work with people of all levels. And th that's why the uh, Behind the Kids series is so good also, because anyone can join in. One of the big yeah. compliments about your brother's, you know, iconic book on drums was that you could really pick that book up and get 20 or 30 pages in and learn yeah. without knowing much about drums. And I think you teach people, like you said, from all levels. Yeah, the, that, that book that's called uh, Realistic Rock. Uh, actually, I do a couple lessons, and one of them I'm taking them through that book and explaining things, and uh, we do it over the Internet. But that's a great book. That's like the Bible. Many drummers went through that book. And it covers starting with a rock beat, really simple, and then 10 pages in, all of a sudden you're playing syncopated beats, you know? And uh, that's a fantastic book, you know? And I love yeah. doing the show. I love doing my 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 show. I, I used to be worried. I go, what am I going to teach? Oh, this, I'll do foot exercises. I'll do this. And, and now it's just like, uh, I just go up, I play a song, I get warmed up, and then I'll talk a little, play, and I'll, I'll come across something. Oh, that's cool. Let me show you what that is. And it's just all on, I'm on guard now. You know, I just do it. Before I was yeah. worried, I was like, but after a while, he's like, what am I, what am I going to do now? <laughs> what am I going to teach? So well, it's more it, on the spur of the moment. Yeah, and I think that that works. And it's live streaming, so people get to be um, involved with you. You know, you made the most of this, uh, these pandemic times, these at-home times, because so you have every Tuesday you have behind the kit. And then on Thursdays, you and your brother have your show, uh, right. Hanging and Banging. And right. uh, and that's Thursday nights, and you can watch that on Facebook or YouTube. And I recommend it because you have really cool guests, and the two of you together have a a, a very fun chemistry that yeah. probably only brothers could have. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it's uh, it, it, that everything just happened. It wasn't like, hey, let's if the pandemic's hitting, let's do something. You know, the the drum company I'm with, which is behind me, they call Sawtooth Drums. Mm -hmm. Plug, it's in the back there. And uh, they, uh, the owner, Joe, is very proactive. He's a drummer, too. And he came up with the idea in 2000, when was it? 20. Yeah, 2020, toward the end, he said, I want to do a little, like, couple of uh, live streams. So he came up with the idea. And then it kept going, and it's, it became popular, and it was good for the company, and I love doing it. And uh, he said, you want to keep doing it? I said, yeah, I love this. And it kept me in shape, see, because uh, Monday, if I didn't play after the, the show, I would sit down and practice in here. And it, it disciplined me to sit there and play. And I've come up with a whole bunch of different licks now, too, because I'm sitting down and I'm practicing, which is great. So it yeah. kept me in shape. Yeah, it was great. And the people enjoyed it because everybody was home. They're still home, but not so much, you know. And the same thing with hanging and banging. I don't. Carmine had some, you know, put it together, the idea, and then he said, "Yeah, we're gonna do this show." I said, "Okay." So now it's just like we do it every Thursday. So it's fun. It's a lot of fun, you know. It's something different. Yeah. Oh, I I think so. I've enjoyed watching uh, a bunch of the episodes, and I had Carmine um, on the show, and mm -hmm. uh, and we had great discussions of of, of his career. And I said, now we have to have you on as well to talk about uh, your career. Because I'm, I grew up uh, watching your play. You know, Carmine might have been yeah. a generation a, a little before, before that. Life. Yeah, right. of course, I have the appreciation for him. But, uh, you know, I grew up as a, as a, a you know, a metal fan. In that era, yeah. 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 And but I so I got to go back and ask you, because you've got a really fascinating uh, beginning to your career. When you're nine years old, you pick up the drums. Uh, you and Carmine, both, he, he's already established at that point. You guys have the same drum teacher. Did you always know that you wanted to be a drummer? Well, see, Carmine's 11 years older than I am. So what happened was uh, before he made it and joined the Vanilla Fudge, he had the local band in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, they would rehearse at my parents' house because we all lived in the house. So... Mm -hmm. It was like for an, I was eight or nine years old, I would sit there on the floor and they'd have all their equipment set up and the drums set and then they would play. So I had this killer entertainment for a young kid. 
And now I'm looking at the amps and the wires, all that stuff interest, interested me. Then they start playing and wow, it sounds like a record, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me started. And uh, so eventually Carmine moved out of the house. He joined the fudge. He was successful. And I kept playing. And then Carmine would come home once in a while and he told my parents, he's getting really good. You should send him for drum lessons. So uh, send him to his name was Dick Bennett in Brooklyn. <clears throat> and that's who Carmine went to. So I went there and he said, yeah, he's good. That's do the lessons. So the lessons consisted of really the traditional books, like the books called Stick Control, Syncopation, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer, All-American Drummer, which is a marching thing. And um, and that's the way I learned. And then I listened to all the music. Yeah. But all the, the music I listened to, I call them the drummers that took a chance. They didn't play it safe, like Mitch Mitchell, Billy Cobham, Bonham, my brother, uh, who else? Uh, well, Buddy Rich, of course. Mm -hmm. But if you listen to those drummers and those bands, the drums are part of the song. Like you said, you could hear, <clears throat> you could have the melody of the drums in your head. Those guys took chances. They didn't just play on top of the song. So I learned that way. So now when I play, uh, once I know the song, I want to get in the song. You know, I've, I, I, once I get it, I picture it as a color or a painting and create something like that fits the song inside of it, you know? So luckily I listened to those guys and they were all great drummers, you know? And can, uh, can you remember seeing Carmine on uh where, where were you when he was on the Ed Sullivan, Ed yeah. Sullivan show? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember we were in the living room, my parents and <clears throat> probably a bunch of friends. And I was more nervous than Carmine. I was like, oh, my God, my brother's on TV. He's got to play. Ah. Mm -hmm. same, same thing when I went to see him play. My parents took me and my sister Terry to see Carmine play, like in the city, Manhattan, at the Fillmore East. And yeah. I used to get really nervous for him when a solo was coming up. Like, man, maybe I should go up and help him. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was totally inspired with that you know and that's a live show we didn't even realize that they were i didn't know Carmine mentioned this a couple of times they rehearsed the whole week before to do that li live ed sullivan show they would do the whole show for five or six days before talk about yeah i had no i had no idea that ed sullivan was live you know we're so used to yeah. talk shows taping in the afternoon now yeah now, now everything's taped. That was a live uh, broadcast <clears throat> and uh, sound had to be right. They had their own sound man, but they couldn't touch the union guys. So mm -hmm. he could only stand there and tell them, put the keyboard up, put the bass drum up, 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 up that way. Yeah, that that's totally nerve wracking. But I remember seeing it. And I was greatly inspired. Like, wow. You know, as well as a full generation of drummers to see uh, this intense performance and see him spinning sticks and doing things that would become a part of rock drumming, but maybe weren't so much at the time. Yeah. Well, back then, it's funny. You look at the other bands that were on Ed Sullivan and the drummers were just like this, you know, like whoever it was, the Turtles, the Doors. or. And then you look at the Vanilla Fudge performance and Carmine's going like this and hitting double toms like this. And Timmy, the bass player, Nobody's seen the bass player hitting his bass mm -hmm. <laughs> and the moves he was making. You look at that, you go, holy shit. That was 1960, what, seven or eight, you know? And then you look at these other bands that the drummers and the bass players just stood there and played, you know? So that was magnificent. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great exp thing for people to watch. You can check it out. It's, yeah. you know, the clips are it's on over. YouTube. It's on YouTube. All over YouTube, yeah. And so I've got to ask you, of course, about Bump. Uh, you know, uh, I fan the motherfuckers. That's you know, I'm not for. sure I knew what it stood for. Yeah, I'm glad that you cleared that up. Of course, I know Angelo. Uh, you know, your old yeah. schoolmate and friend from that band. Uh, obviously, Angelo went on later to uh, engineer uh, those classic Dio albums and lived here yeah. in Las Vegas for quite a bit of time. How I I know him, and uh, I was always so fascinated to have him tell me stories about working with John Lennon. Because right. you guys were the final rhythm section to perform live um, mm -hmm. with John Lennon. He jammed once uh, on stage at the Garden, I think, after that. But his last band performance was us. Um, 
was you guys yeah. and you were kids. I think you were 16 years old, right? Yeah. Um, we hooked up with him. Yeah. I was 16 years old. I used to go to school the next day Amazing. and, uh, you know, we, we met him and then we started hanging out with him at the record plant studios. And then he asked us to do, we did hand claps first on uh, whatever gets you through the night. So that night we were doing things with him. And then in the day I'd wake up and go, I got to go to school, <laughs> go into the school and I'm going, this is like a black and white world. I just came from color, mm -hmm. you know? So I used to be drumming on the desk, you know, the te you know, teachers trying to teach. And I'm over there, you know, and then she's going, wait, 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 wait. who's that drumming? Vincent, stop that drumming. And I'd stand up and go, excuse me, did anyone else in this room play with one of the Beatles last <laughs> night? And then I got up and walked out. You know? That's so great. Yeah, I think you, Angelo quit school too. I quit school, and uh, which was okay. My parents let me quit because Carmine was already successful, so I didn't want to. I just wasn't interested in school at that point. So um, that might have been the, toward the end of the middle of this high school thing, tenth tenth grade maybe, and uh, and then from there. Uh, Thereafter, I, I kept playing, playing. Then at 17, 18, I hooked up with Rick Derringer. Yeah, well, before we get to Rick out. Derringer, because Derringer actually calls your house, but we, we, we can't get that far without, of course, um, talk a little about the Hilton Hotel, which is where that final show came. It was a, a TV yeah. appearance. And uh, the, uh, the, the two-headed masks, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, um, we, we started doing the thing with the, the hand class with John. And then we, we didn't do a fanboy thing on him. It was nine piece band. We had four horn players. So he knew we rehearsed upstairs every night in the record plant studios in New, in New York city. So he would come and watch us. It's, you know, you're playing all of a sudden you see John Lennon walk in and sit on the stairs. I mean, my mom, I remember the first day my muscle cramped. I was like, Oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. look who's there. Even even when we first met him and did hand claps, we walk into the studio. We didn't know what it was for. Jimmy Iovine, who was producing it, said, uh, "Can you guys come do hand claps?" Sure. Go in and we put the headphones on. We look. The fucking John Lennon. Now he's talking to you on the headphones. How many times have you heard his voice and? movies of him and this and now he's talking to you <laughs> it was just totally intense and then uh so eventually we did a number of things with him and then he asked us to do this live gig at the new york hilton and the hill and the, the show was about sir lou grade who was a a big music millionaire in Le england and uh john didn't like him he thought he was two-faced so he sat down with us and said I want you to, we're going to get masks made of your face and we're going to put it on the back of your head with a skull cap. So it'd be a bald person with two faces. You're going to wear black jumpsuits. I'm going to wear red. So, okay. So we met at the record plant. He got in the van with us and drove and we to the place to get our faces made. Then we drove to get the fitted for the jumpsuits and he went with us. It was really something else. And then, uh, and the gig came, and it was a black tie affair. The mayor was in the audience, uh, Shirley MacLaine, people like that, you know, Tom Jones. I think Tom was on the show, too. And then they introduced John Lennon. There was just like a tuxedo sh show. Tom, Tom, Tom Jones comes out with his big bow tie and shit. And then they go, and John Lennon and et cetera. They didn't say B-O-M-F or bomb. <laughs> I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Said it on the bass drum. And we come out with two faces on no hair black jumpsuits he's in red with his hair tied back and everybody's going oh shit what's going on so we played three songs with him and it's little... pretty badass uh you know john Lennon yeah. has a little bit of a punk rock in yeah him as well you know uh, when he doesn't like somebody you know, he's always the cocky one or the, the the quick one with uh some of the comments but this was really funny that he wanted to do this and uh so after that, probably about six years ago, I got 
Guitar Aficionado magazine, whatever it's called. And in the back is a full page ad, not ad, but article with a picture of John Lennon and my band. And I'm right, right next to John. I got my arm on him. And it says it mentions John Lennon. It mentions me because I, I played with Sabbath and I was more known than in, anybody else in the picture. And, um, and it says, and this was his last live performance. And I went, what? I didn't know that. I, like me, the kid from Brooklyn, banging on the school desk, played one of the Beatles' last performances. I couldn't believe it. it and, it, and of course, Angelo was with me, too. Angelo Curie on bass. So yeah. what, what a thing to share, uh, and especially as a young person. And of course, uh, people who watch my interview with Carmine, uh, people everywhere are concerned about your mother's lasagna pan. Uh, <laughs> this has become uh, a big news across the world this many years yes. later. Uh, you, you, you've got to tell us a little bit about it. I know well, you told this one a lot. Yeah. Well, he, he came up to the rehearsal room, you know, and uh, I used to really be in the pot back then, you know, like mm -hmm. to smoke pot. And he'd sit down. We'd, I'd smoke a joint with him. You want to smoke a joint? He always wanted Coke, but I didn't do Coke. Mm -hmm. So little secret, right? So we smoked a joint. And we're talking. We're talking about Italian food. And I explained to John my grandmother's from Italy. And my, my family, my mother makes the killer lasagna, just authentic and blah, 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 blah. And we're talking about it. And I said, I'll have her make you some. So <clears throat> that was that night. And then a couple of days later, my mom makes the lasagna. She gives me the pan. Okay, I'm going to bring it to the studio. So I bring it in. I see John. Luckily, he was there. I went, hey, John, this is for you. This is for my mother. She made the lasagna especially for you. It's the uh, real deal. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> he took it. You know, is this the pan with aluminum foil? And he took it. And then uh, about a month later, Rod Stewart's playing the Madison Square Garden with Carmine. <clears throat> and there was some sort of a party for the show. And Carmine invited my parents to go down. It was in the city. And they did. And then uh, when they were there, my mother went, oh, look, there's John Lennon. I want to go talk to him, see if he liked the lasagna. So mm -hmm. Carmine brought him over to meet him. <clears throat> so she had a long, nice conversation. She said, you know, I'm Carmine's mom, and I'm Vinny from the, the band, the record plant, and the major lasagna. And they talked for a bit. And at the end of the conversation, my mom, being from Brooklyn, says, do you have the pan back? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she wanted the pan back. Mm -hmm. So we never got it back. We think Yoko's got it. So who knows? Yeah, Yoko. But it's a that, funny story. Yoko got probably has the pan after all these yeah, years. That, that had all the through. lasagna juices in the pan, you know, from cooking probably 10, 15 years of lasagna in a pan, you know. Mm -hmm. so well, as funny. Carmine, as Carmine said, an Italian mother, uh, the, your pan is important, and yeah. uh, you know, and <laughs> only a mother could talk to John Lennon and and. You and know, not be fan fangirl, fan mom. Yes, yeah, and uh, which, <laughs> mom. which is one of the uh, great great stories, and uh, what an incredible uh, experience for you at such a young age. So, oh, Rick yeah, Derringer, still, yeah, Rick Derringer comes and calls the house. Your mother assumes he's looking for Carmine. You know, Carmine's yeah. the well, rock. Well, what star. happened was I went out to California after I quit school and played with this band with Jimmy Haslip on bass who was from the Yellow Jackets and just a great guy, great bass player, and Phil Brown on guitar, who went on to write a lot of TV commercials. And we were doing something. Carmine was trying to produce it. And there I met a girl who knew this band called Axis in, in Louisiana, Shreveport. She goes, you would be really good with these guys. You know, they're, they're three-piece power trio. So I hooked up with them, moved down to Louisiana. With, I you know, brought my drums. And we were together about two months, three months, maybe. And then uh, <clears throat> Rick Derringer calls the house, my mom's house. He says, hey, Rick Derringer, I'm looking for Vinny. She goes, oh, you must be looking for Carmine. No, I'm looking for Vinny. Oh, Carmine, Vinny, Carmine. So finally, she gives Rick the number down Streetport. And I was outside somewhere. And somebody goes, hey, Vinny, Rick Derringer's on the phone. We're like, what? Rick Derringer? <laughs> Holy shit. So I talked to him. He goes, look, I'm putting the band together because he heard me at the record plant studios with, with the John Lennon thing. We did about eight songs with Jimmy Iovine producing. 
And uh, I guess Jimmy was working on it. Rick walked in. Who's that? And who's the drummer? That's Carmine's brother. Oh, man, because he's looking to put a band together. So that's how that connection worked. <clears throat> that's called being in the right place at the right time. So he calls me, says, I'm putting a band together. I'm looking for a bass player, guitar player, and drummer. I said, why don't you come down here? This is a three-piece band. You know, we can hook up. So he did. He came back to, came to Shreveport, which was a big deal. Everybody was like, Rick, that was just coming. Oh, my God. So he came down and he liked us. And for some reason, he didn't take the bass player, Jay Davis. So he asked me and Danny Johnson, who was the guitar player, to, to join him. And uh, from there, we all moved to New York, including Jay, because he got an offer to put play with Foreigner before the album came out. Mm -hmm. He was working with them. But they were only paying him $50 a week. <laughs> so he couldn't. He had kids and everything. He couldn't make that work. So he left that band, unfortunately, when before that hit and broke, you know. So that's how I hooked up with Rick Derringer. And we did like three albums. And then Danny and I decided to leave about two years later and do our Axis band again with Jay. And we got a deal on RCA Records, put one album out. Andy yeah, Johns it, produced it too. It was great. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And there's three uh, Derringers, two studio three. albums with you, and then the live, the live. album. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 1980 then, is yeah. Uh, uh, the year that John Lennon passes away for one, which must have been uh, uh, obviously <clears throat> devastating. Well, it's devastating to everyone. But yeah, that year also has other meaning for you because that is the year that you get asked to join Black Sabbath. Um, right. Tell me a little bit. because So Bill Ward did go on tour for the album. Heaven and, and Hell. Yeah, for heaven and hell, and he uh, he quits or is fired. You tell us what happened to Bill Ward. Uh, well, Bill left, and he didn't like to fly, and he was, you know, he liked his beer. <laughs> That's all I'll say. And he used to travel in a motorhome with his brother and his wife instead of flying. A band would fly. He would travel in a motorhome. So they were scheduled to play um, Denver, McNichols Arena, big arena, the old arena, and he didn't show up. So the band had to postpone that gig. And luckily, they had uh, four days off after that. So they went back to L.A. and started trying to find a drummer. And somehow they got my number. I don't know how. Uh, I thought maybe I left it on the rainbow wall going up to the bathroom or something. I don't know how mm -hmm. they got I think it was somebody from Warner Brothers. And I get a call from the tour manager. Hey, you want to, uh, when they, we're looking for a drummer, what do you, you interested? Yeah, there we go. that'd be awesome. Do um, you want to meet, uh, come meet Tony Iommi tomorrow night at the hotel? Yeah. Well, tonight, I don't know what it was. So I went down and then Tony walks in and he had the Axis album under his arm. Because this is really good, really good. So he heard me play, so he liked it. And... Uh, so we got on really well. He's a jokester. I'm a jokester. He's got, you know, great sense of humor. And, and it, it, we just hit it, you know. So he goes, well, why don't you come down to rehearsal tomorrow? So next day I went down to rehearsal, SIR Studios and Sunset Boulevard. Met Geezer, Ronnie, and Jeff Nichols, keyboard player. And uh, I had this little puny set of drums I brought in my car. And we set up and we played. First song I played with the band was Neon Nights. Okay. So that was the first song I played with Ronnie ever. And in 2009, it was the last song I played with Ronnie. It was an encore. Wow. So that it. song took took a journey in between that was incredible. Full circle. Yeah. So uh, I played and then... Uh, the only they liked it. They had four days to rehearse. They were so happy. We played a little bit. Then they went to the pub to celebrate. And I'm standing there going, I got to learn all these songs. Holy shit. So I stayed back in the rehearsal place with the keyboard player, Jeff. And he helped me. We played the songs. We had Walkmans, you know, the old tape Walkmans. And I was making charts out and cheat sheets. And, uh, and then the next day we played more. But then they went to the pub again. <laughs> And then the third day, everybody's getting nervous. Like, shit, we didn't really play very much. And uh, we played more that day. So we only had four days rehearsal. And then the first gig was Hawaii at an open-air stadium. Yeah, Aloha Stadium. Aloha Stadium, yeah. yeah. So it was nerve-wracking, you know, learning all that stuff. And 
and uh, figuring out how they played. It was behind the beat. That and that and and Tony and Kiza had a heavy Birmingham accent from England, right? And I wasn't around that much, so sometimes I didn't understand what they were saying. So I go over to Ronnie, and go, "What did he say?" <laughs> I can't understand him. And Ronnie would help me along. So he translate. Yeah, and before that, before that happened, I got a call from Sharon Osborne. Right, this is a good year. Sharon asked me if I want to go fly to England to meet Ozzy because they, they're going to put a band together. Mm -hmm. And uh, they heard about me. I don't know where. I don't know where she got the number either. But uh, she said, you know, Ozzy's in England. You go hang out. If it works out, you know, we'll take it from there, blah, blah. So I actually turned it down. I didn't, I'd never been out of the country. And I was like, I was like, what, 19 years old, you know, maybe going on 20. And uh, I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then I heard Ozzy it was crazy. I asked Carmine, hey, what about playing with Ozzy? Is he nuts? Carmine goes, oh, yeah. So I was like, whoa. So luck, I, I turned that. I didn't do it. Let's say I didn't do it. And then a month later, I get a call from Sabbath. You know, and this was right in L.A. It was easy. I went boom, boom, boom. So it was meant to be, you know. Now, your brother would play with Ozzy. Was it after that or before that? A after, way after. Yeah. So, and yeah. he had a rough time as he tells of it. Uh, so you probably made the right move and you certainly um, had such a long career and friendship with Ronnie James Dio that I think yeah. you obviously made the right choice. And plus, you know, I knew Randy Rhodes too. I remember seeing him in uh, actually my band Axis and Randy was in Quiet Riot. We played gigs together, a couple of gigs in LA area. Mm -hmm. And I got his number. I said, man, you play great. Why don't we exchange numbers? You know, maybe we could do something. So who knows? I might have been on that plane with them. Yeah. You know, because because thing. you're young. You're young and you go, hey, you want to go for a plane ride? Yeah, let's go for a plane ride. You know, I don't know. I always think of that, that I could have been on that plane with them. So, yeah. Uh, and as, so as we said, you, your relationship with Ronnie James Dio yeah. really takes off then because you do the couple of years with Savage, uh, 82. Uh, Dio forms and and tell right. me a little bit about how that how you and Ronnie leave Sabbath to form Dio. Well, we were actually at the Rainbow Club, right, in Hollywood, and and we're having a drink and something to eat. And Ronnie goes, "Look, I'm going to leave the band. I'm going to start my own band, <clears throat> and I'd like you <clears throat> like to know if you want to join me, basically." And I said, "Yeah, how cool is this? Let's get to play with." somebody like Ronnie it's in close to home we can put mm -hmm. this together it's exciting because Sabbath wanted me to, to stay with them too so I chose to go with Ronnie and uh so then it was just me and him he played bass and we'd go in a rehearsal room and we had Holy Diver you know he'd have boom but I don't don't bum bum just that riff I put in the accent down boom boom da ba ba do you know we worked on it together. It was just me and bass. Sometimes he played guitar. And then we started having guitar players come down. One of them was Jakey e. Lee. Right. And he sounded great and everything. But for some reason, Ronnie didn't choose him. He decided he wanted to have more of an international flair to the band. And that's because he's played with international people all the time, like mm -hmm. Sabbath and, and Rainbow. Every, you know, they were British people in, in the band so that would give it more of a international kind of flavor so he said you know let's go to england and uh, find that's guitar players so we flew to england we shared a room which is funny because he'd like to stay up reading he could read a book a night and i'm like yeah shut can you shut the light man the light you guys are so, like the odd couple you know it was the odd couple it was and uh, it was hilarious. And then we went to a number of clubs. We looked in the paper. Oh, somebody's playing here. Let's go see him. Okay, we go there. And it's a reggae band. So I don't think that's the guy. And we wound up at a Motorhead show. It was so fucking loud at the Marquee Club. It was pinned against the wall. And we were waiting for Jimmy Bain to come back in town. Because Ronnie contacted him and said, we're looking for a guitar player. And he knew somebody. So Jimmy told us about Vivian Campbell. He's in Ireland in a band called Sweet Savage. So Jimmy called him at two in the morning <laughs> and Viv flew in 
and we jammed in London. We had a, a, a good jam, taped it, and everything was great. We all got along and went back and listened to the tape, and Ronnie and I both really loved Viv. And the next thing you know, uh, about a month, a couple of weeks later, Viv and Jimmy flew into L.A., stayed at Ronnie's house. Uh, actually, stayed at the Oakwood Apartments. Remember those places? Sure. Then moved into Ronnie's house when Ronnie had another house. So, uh, And then we started uh, rehearsing at Sound City and writing all the stuff, you know. And Sound City was cool because it had a rehearsal place. It was like a U-shaped building with a parking lot in the middle. One side was the rehearsal. One side was the studios. So we would, we would uh, all that noise, that's the gardeners. They always come when, when I'm on these things. Mm -hmm. So we'd go to a rehearsal place and we would... Uh, let me put that back on. We would rehearse when we had four songs written. We take all the gear, drag it across the parking lot, go into the studio and just set it up. I mean, you know, like a cymbal stand with the cymbal still on it. You know, that we didn't break it down, roll the, the amps in. And then we started recording Holy Diver. And Angelo was the, uh, Angelo Arcuri was the engineer. Um, and that's how that whole album came about. You know, we wrecked that place. We were just destroying all the pinball games in there and the candy machines. And we did uh, crazy things in that place, punch holes in the wall. And yeah, we did a lot of stuff. One time, Carmine rehearsed next to us there with the vanilla fudge. Mm -hmm. So when they were in there rehearsing, we said, let's put all the cases in front of the door so they can't get out. <laughs> we piled up all the cases to the ceiling and then we ran back in our room. Then later on, you hear Boom, 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 boom. Hear him yelling. Hey, open the fucking door. So he just did crazy shit there. It's amazing, you know, the consistency of people in your life, which is so great. Your childhood friend who plays with John Lennon with you, Angelo, is now engineering yeah. these albums. You and Ronnie formed this bond in Black Sabbath. Now you have your brother next door uh, rehearsing. And it <laughs> seems like you and your brother always had a really good relationship. You usually hear about brothers fighting or maybe there's jealousy over gigs or things but it seems like you guys really got along oh yeah we really we really do get along and uh there was never any fighting you know his, he's he's 11 years older than i am a bit of a different generation we weren't competing that much with each other you know and uh but the good thing was he was such a great drummer it, when i started playing i said well i i'm gonna have to really buckle down and become really good as well as much as i can because you know my brother's known as one of the top drummers you know so but we always got along up until this today actually i called him today and told him we're doing a, a song we're going to try to get another deal together so we got double drums on it so i i call him today and told him how sloppy he played <laughs> <laughs> he didn't play it sloppy but he likes to do things fast and, Dude, you got to get the, the intro exactly what, what I play. Because when he sent me this stuff, I copied his fills. I listened to his fills. So we play some of them together, and it sounds good. And he he just likes to play the whole song. I said, can't play the whole song. I punched in fill by fill. You know, when it didn't seem right, I'll, because uh, I got the studio here, I'll start and repunch that fill in so it matches his fill. So I thought he was going to do all the same fills, but apparently he just winged it on some of them. So I said, you know, just just because um, I've been recording at home, excuse me, uh, on the system, Cubase system, long, way longer than he has, you know. And I, I set him up. I actually built him the computer and set him all up at his house uh, with the Cubase and the sound cards, all the shit. So uh, he's learning really good. But I said, you know, here's the way to do it when you can't figure something out. Let's go back, punch in. That's good. And then move on to the next one. You know, then avant-garde here and there and there and there. And there. So that's what he's doing. Yeah. And so it's, I, I like to give him shit sometimes. Dude, well, I think, that, that. <laughs> I think that's the, uh, the brotherly thing um, to do. Yeah. I, I don't want to get too much into the Dio history because it's so it's out there. You know, there's so yeah. much about it. You've spoke about it so much. The music alone is, is timeless. The records uh, uh, are, are, you know, these are things that people will be listening to uh, forever. And we're, we're fortunate to have that. So you do leave Dio 
I think it's probably around 89. And you do, you know, you, you did some other projects. 87. 87. 87. Okay. I didn't realize it was that early. Yeah. 80, uh, end of 87. He was doing the Lock Up the Wolves album. Right. And you were on the, you, you did some of the pre production on that record. I think the songs were pretty much together at that point. Yeah, the songs were together. I, I even got some writing on that, on that bunch of songs. And then uh, um, I went, you know what? I can't even remember what came first. It must have came first where I left and I played with World War Three with Jimmy Bain. Mm -hmm. The band was on Hollywood Records. And, uh, and, but I don't know when the hell that was. That was a right around that time. But the time we're talking about is I left, we worked on the songs. The whole album was there on, on uh, ADAT tape and we're going to go in the studio. And then uh, I, I think that's the time I got the call from Sabbath again. Oh no, that was later on. Well, anyway, I got the call from Sabbath and they were on tour. Bill Ward couldn't play. No, that was in the 90s. <laughs> I'm mixed No, up. there's a lot. I, I don't even know anymore. But I yeah. did leave and play with Jimmy Bain with the band called World War Three on Hollywood Records. That was the first time I left. So, because yeah. Uh, yeah, you um, would you would come back to Dio uh, again. Yeah, again. And uh, but you did a bunch of different things. It, your career has not been one of those things where I mean, yes, we know you from Dio and Black Sabbath, but you, we, I don't think you can rest. You you work on right. different things. You're playing. Um, stands out and you experimented with different projects. It was never like, I'm the guy from this, that's it. You've always right. kept moving. And well, and different styles of what you do too. The drum war shows that you do with your brother shows the, the different styles that you guys have. And I think yeah. that's a a fun a fun thing. If people haven't seen it, I recommend uh, you know Check when it, it comes around. And there's videos yeah. and DVDs and uh, people can get caught up in uh, uh, why is he Carmine Apice and you're Vinny Apice? You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot to watch. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's funny because we both had kind of the same career. We didn't play with one band, you know, and I always wondered, I always, as a kid, I thought I'd get in a band and we just work it and become uh, successful and be in that band, you know? So I always wondered what would it be like to be in one band, like say Aerosmith, Joey mm -hmm. Kramer. Yeah, he's in one band, you know? Um, it didn't work out for me that way or Carmine. We wound up coming to an end of these bands and then, okay, something else, another door opened and another door. So luckily those doors opened. So I was able to go to different things, but I stayed with more or less with, the way I like to play, which is heavy, heavy rock, you know, heavy metal, whatever you, you want to call it. But um, yeah, we both kind of, when you look back, it's the same career. Yeah. He's yeah. with the fuzz, he's cactus, this, so Rod Stewart, this, this, boom, boom. Same with me, you know? It's yeah. Crazy. It's, it's, I always say, sometimes I have someone on who you could say, I'm the guy from this. And, and that's it. And that's it. And that is not the case with a career. And that's why that you get a little lost in the timelines because there is so much um, coming back and forth. You did go back to Black Sabbath, obviously, and later uh, Heaven and Hell, which becomes yeah. which which is the guys from Black Sabbath again, um, yeah. with Ronnie James uh, Dio singing as well. Um, was there ever talk of you doing any of those Tony Martin years at that after that at that point? No, because I was I was you know Ronnie was my buddy, my brother. And uh, Tony Martin got in, got in the band, and and I just they I don't think they really asked. I think they realized I was locked in with Ronnie, you know. So I didn't uh, get an opportunity to 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 do yeah. that, you know. So I was just staying with Ron's. Uh, that was a whole other phase of Sabbath, you know, with Tony Martin in it. So. Of course, yeah, and and Cozy Powell, and you know. Uh, Obviously, they had a different yeah. thing. Um, but when they started Heaven and Hell, it was with Cozy Powell. Oh, no, what we did the Humanizer album. Right. 1992, that I know. Cozy Powell was in the band because he was playing with Tony and Sabbath at that point. So right. they got Ronnie back and they trying to record the album and it just wasn't going well. Ronnie wasn't getting along with Cozy. Cozy wasn't getting along with Ronnie. 
So there's a lot of friction, a lot of money spent, and not a lot of music produced. So Cozy had an accident. He fell off a horse, hmm. and he broke his pelvis. So he couldn't play anymore. And then they're uh, sitting there going, scratching the head. What do we do? Let's call Vinny. Mm -hmm. So I come in, fly over, and we start knocking out those songs, writing new stuff. We lived in a house in Stafford, Ronnie and I, and they right outside of Birmingham. That's where Geezer and Tony lived. And we used to rehearse in the living room with little amps. You know, Ronnie had a little guitar amp with a mic on it. It was like being back in the basement in Brooklyn. You know, Tony had a little guitar amp, comes over with his uh, sweatpants on, his slippers and shit. It was, a, I even suggested, why don't we use this as the next stage set? Like a living room and we're all relaxed. You know, he's wearing slippers and all this shit. So, so we we wrote and things moved. Because I'm easy to work with. You know, I no problem. Tell me what the deal is. Get it up front. Boom, boom, boom. And then we finished that album. So uh, that was with Cozy. So I got on that album. And then uh, the next thing was Heaven and Hell. It was with Bill Ward. But it was taking too long. This was 2006. They were working on the Dio Years record. You know, they put out their record. And the company, record company, wanted three new songs. Yeah. Try to get that together from, from the, the guys. So I was working with Bill, but it was taking too long. It wasn't going smoothly. Da, 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 da. Finally, they had enough and they just said, let's call Vinny. <laughs> so I flew in that night. And uh, when I got in in the morning, you know, slept a little bit. And then that night went to Tony's. I haven't seen everybody in about four or five years. And it was like, cool. We had a beer and everything. And then I started getting drum sounds that night. And a couple of days we finished the songs, the three songs. So uh, that's how Heaven and Hell started, you know. But uh, I made a deal with Wendy. She called up and said, uh, Vinny, you want to play with the boys again? I said, oh, yeah. She goes, well, here's what they're doing. They're doing an album. They're in England. We'll fly over there. You got to do three songs, blah, 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 blah. So she cut me a deal with the money and all that. And then I, being a jokester, I said, listen, I got to tell you. She goes, what? I said, I gained like 200 pounds, man. I'm like over 300 pounds now. I had to get a, 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 a new seat made custom to hold me. And she's going, what? <laughs> What's she going to do? She already mm -hmm. made a deal with me, you know? And this is not an insult to anybody or anything that I love food too. And uh, yeah, I you, you, you might've had too many, uh, too many, Lasagna. Devil dogs. too many. Devil oh, dogs. devil dog. Oh, I, I know that. that's your favorite. I love them. And then, uh, so Wendy couldn't back out of the deal. So I flew all the way over to England. Then they said, come down to Tony's. We'll pick you up. So somebody at the car came, picked me up. And I got to Tony's. They're all waiting to see what I look like. They think I'm going to be pretty big. <laughs> and they go, Finney's here. And I could see them turning around, looking out of the, down the hallway to see first what I look like. And I walk in and they go, you bastard. But it broke the ice. It was almost like it was meant to be. It broke the ice after not seeing Tony Gates. Everybody's laughing. And, <clears throat> you know, it was just a crack up. So, and then that was it. It was perfect. Yeah. Ice and, broken. And a lot of memorable shows, great live video. Um, Let me tell that. you about Dev Devil Dogs. So, we're playing at um, Madison Square Garden with Heaven and Hell. I think it was the Felt Forum or something. And all my friends, I'm putting them on the list, the guest list. What can I bring you? What can I bring you? I said, you don't have to bring anything. Just come down to the show. Have fun. You know, blah, 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 blah. Don't know. What can I bring you? All right, bring me Devil Dogs. So I wind up with 20 boxes of Devil Dogs. Mm -hmm. Devil Dogs has a cupcake that was New York, a company called Drake's from New York. And it long, skinny with cream in the middle. I love those things. I grew up, grew up on them. All the Drake's cupcakes were fantastic. Yeah. So here I am now with all these boxes of devil dogs before the show. So I go, you know what? Tony likes sweets too. He likes to eat. So I got some milk and I went to Tony's dressing room. I said, Tony, you got to try this. I grew up on this. I explained that, you know, this was a New York thing, but blah, blah, blah. it's a devil dog. And I gave him some milk and he's eating. He's, mm, mm, this is good. You got to have milk with it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Then I realized later, 
I just gave the guitar player from Black Sabbath something called a devil dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, How cool is that? You know, it's a totally different uh, summoning of the devil yeah. with, with Black a Sabbath. A devil. It's a perfect guy to eat a devil dog. Rather than I gave him a, a ring ding or a ding dong or a mm -hmm. Twinkie. He ate a Twinkie. No, it's a devil dog, you know. So I realized later on that's pretty funny. Yeah. You've, uh, we all know your great drumming career, but you've turned John Lennon. You gave John Lennon, uh, you know, homemade las Brooklyn lasagna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gave that's Tony true. Omi his first devil dog. That's right. And then I used to make, we were all into tuna fish sandwiches. Ronnie and I, Ronnie's a finicky eater, but we both love tuna fish sandwiches. Usually on white bread, we always we had it on the on the uh, rider at the backstage. Uh, two cans of tuna, a can open, a mayonnaise, and white Wonder Bread or something like that. So I started making them, and then uh, when we were in England doing these albums, I make it for Tony. He loved it too, especially there where you can get the really good crusty baguettes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in California, you can't get that shit here. They don't mm -hmm. know how to make bread here. And then I'd make a sandwich and I Tony would eat it and Ronnie would eat it. And yeah, it was crazy. So I'm like yes, a culinary yes. drummer. That's right. Yeah. It's a whole different side of you that uh, people didn't know. I want to <laughs> ask you, because a, uh, a few of my viewers asked about Kill Devil Hill, which is a mm -hmm. band that you played in uh, with Rex from Pantera. And right. uh I thought it was a little bit of a departure for you. Uh, and But everyone asks, says, well, you got to find out why it didn't work out. I know the answer, and I think it's a good one. So I'll let you share it with people. Well, it was a great band. We, we started with uh, me and the guitar player, Mark Savon. We live close together in Woodland Hills, California. And then we, you know what happened? I had to have soldier, shoulder surgery coming off Heaven and Hell Tour because mm -hmm. I was playing all the drums up in the air killed my shoulder. So before I went in to get surgery, I locked down all these grooves in the studio at Jeff Pilson's studio, different tempos. And this was supposed to be for a download for Cleopatra Records anyway. But I had about 25 different grooves, tempos, all this stuff with a great drum sound, sounded like a big bottom room. And then I got the surgery. So I couldn't play for four months, let's say. So Mark would come down my studio and we'd edit the drum tracks and he started playing to and we started putting the songs together that way. Then he said, I know a singer, this guy, Dewey Bragg. So he comes down, uh, I hear his voice, I go, wow, this guy's great, you know? Uh, he comes down and, and the look and everything, tattoos and the beard and uh, the fuck, all that shit. And uh, I'm like, great, this could be a new thing, you know? It's a newer, younger band. Right. Um, and then we had Jimmy Bain playing bass. And it sounded really heavy. And then eventually Jimmy, Jimmy was a little different at that point. You know, he was a little more spaced, I'd let's say, but he still played great and loved Jimmy. And uh, so it didn't work out with Jimmy. So then I said, you know, why don't my friend Rex Brown, you know, I know him from the road, you know, blah, blah. Let me call him. I called him. I went down to Texas, stayed at his house. And then he joined the band. So it was really fucking heavy band. It was a lot of fun and uh, good songs. Uh, we didn't have good management. You know, we needed somebody to keep it together. But what happened was everybody was late. <laughs> Anything we did, it was late, right? And I'm not late. And when I play with Sabbath, with Heaven and Hell, Tony would be there half hour before call time, testing his amps and trying his, his pedals and all that shit. Ronnie would be there be, before we started Geezer, too. Everybody was a pro, and everybody was there way before on time. <clears throat> these, these guys, especially Dewey, uh, man, he would show up an hour or two late, and then Rex would show up a little bit late. Dewey was the worst. So eventually I got really tired of, okay, Lobby call, 7 p.m. And we go down there and wait an hour for the rest of the band. You know how that gets. Mm -hmm. And I had to drive 80 miles to rehearsal because I live out near Temecula now. We'd rehearse in North Hollywood. That's 80 mile drive. I would be there 20 minutes before, three o'clock, like 20 to three. And it, 
bam, we can get there till 3.30, quarter to four. And I'm like, this fucking sucks, man, you know? So eventually I couldn't take it anymore, so I left. Well, and you man, said that... You said that it was happening with shows too. Like, oh, yeah. yeah then it started totally. happening with shows. You're going on, it's Monday night, you're playing someplace, and you're supposed to go on at 9 30, which is good. 9 30, not too late. And by the time we get to the gig, it's it's 9 15, and Dewey didn't have his in ears. And blah, 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 blah. And we go on at 10 30, quarter to 11, sometimes 11, because he was nobody was ready. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we play a couple songs and people would leave because it was late on a Monday night. So it got to be that, too. So it was just really frustrating because the band was great. I love the band. I wish we would have uh, went on from there. You know, it was a really good band. And playing with Rex was fantastic. You know, I never seen and, somebody blow out so many bass amps in my life. Yeah. Because ah, everything was on 11. It's uh, <laughs> the experience, though, is great a lesson for young musicians or people who are in bands forming that right. uh, no one's time is more valuable than anyone else's time. If That's I right. got to be here and I can be here, you've got to do the same. And uh, That's why you're a band. <clears throat> yeah. You know, Gene Simmons came down to a rock fantasy camp and said the exact same thing. He goes, you know what? Talked about being on time. He goes, I still uh, am honored to be on a stage when I get to play. And, uh, but I'm always early. And then he had a book in his boot. <laughs> I don't know why it was in his boot. He had this girl come up, take the book out, and it was the schedule. Because I was supposed to be here at Rock Fantasy Camp. What does that say? Uh, be here at 12. Then he called David Fish off the owner. What time was I here? You were here at uh, 1030. He goes, I'm always early. I'm, I cherish being on stage with the band, the whole thing. And he was talking about it, you know, and I went, you know what? That's the coolest thing. You know, guy yeah, like that, he doesn't need to be on time, but uh, he's on time. And Sabbath was on time. Um, Ronnie's always on time, you know, and I would sit there and wait. And I'm going, man, you know, this sucks after a while. So that's yeah, what <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, I want to jump ahead a little bit. I can't keep you all day. You got things to do. Uh, last in line, that's what I want to uh, sort of uh, wrap up with because uh, yeah. there's two, two great albums. Uh, originally, you put together uh, the core lineup of that original Dio band, Claude Schnell, uh, Vivian Campbell, Jimmy Bain, uh, right. and yourself, and you find Andrew Freeman, who's a, a great singer. He's from the East Coast, uh, and he comes in. And in the beginning, it's more of a just playing the Dio songs, you know, uh, the hits. Yeah, it was just a jam. Vivian called up and said, hey, I'm with Jimmy. You want to get together and jam like tomorrow or whenever it was? I said, yeah, that sounds good. And we got together, just the three of us, and started playing the old Dio songs, no vocals. And Viv's trying to remember the solos. And we're having a laugh, you know. We're trying to remember the song. So it was so much fun that uh, let's do it next week. And next, the next week, Andy Freeman was in town. I played with Andy a long time ago with George Lynch. We did a, a mini tour with George. And I was amazed that this guy could sing 20 gigs in a row at full volume. George plays real loud. I like to play loud, but mm -hmm. he was able to do it. He took care of himself. So I was really impressed by Andy and what a great voice he has. So I told him we're going to do this. He knows all the deal. So he came down and jammed with us, started singing. And then we all went, holy shit, this sounds good. Viv was blown away. Uh, Jimmy, too. I knew him already, Andy. And then we decided, uh, why don't we do some gigs, you know? So our manager at the time was Steve Strange, who passed on, rest in yeah. peace. And um, he booked us for five or six shows in, in, in uh, Europe, and then one in Japan. And then uh, he got us a deal on Frontier Records. Really good deal, too. And we did two records. And uh, we've been touring and we can only play in between everybody's schedules, but we go out and do four shows and then come home maybe the next uh, two weeks, we, two weeks off, we could play a couple of shows on the weekend. We would fly out kind of thing, but we didn't fly out. We booked the gig so we can bring our, our road crew and use our own gear. 
There's a big difference, you know, using your own gear. So now we're um, we're still going. We just came back from a Florida uh, festival we did, and uh, and then actually just came back from Vegas. We were at Danny uh, Corker's Coca De- De- Desert Moon Studios. Desert Moon Studios was Danny Corker, and uh, we recorded there. We finished six more songs. We've rehearsed there before, and we wrote some great stuff in his room. I even told him, I said, "Man, this room is good. We write." good stuff it's a good vibe so we just finished six more songs and now we're going to finish this album up we got a new record company with uh ear music mm-hmm. and uh we got an ep coming out first and then this, then uh then the album talking to new managers and so things are happening you know it's and it's great on... playing with viv vivian playing and i we love it you know we're still he's from ireland i'm from brooklyn but we lock in same with iomi and me and geezer we're from different parts of the world. We didn't grow up together and we play together and it's the same groove and feel and uh, it's very interesting, you know? So, yeah. And, and uh, so last the line has had some changes. Claude Schnell, it, it, it didn't really work out as far as going to the original yeah. band, <clears throat> you know? I mean, yeah. Claude can, didn't work out. Yeah. There was some, some, ish, some things that happened and then, uh, Jimmy Bain, uh, we played a, a cruise in 2016 with Def Leppard. It was the weirdest cruise you'd ever been on because all of us, we were scheduled to play on Sunday. We played a gig on Thursday on land, the pre-party. Then we all got on the ship. And then uh, this girl, we're in the bar on Saturday night. Def Leppard's going to perform. And this girl comes down crying, screaming, what happened? Jimmy, he's sick. He's, he's, I think he's dead. And somehow before she said that, I knew what was coming. I knew this is the day I see Jimmy. Because Jimmy was a partier. You know, mm-hmm. he lived a, lo- a wild life and a real rock rock star life with, you know, I mean, he, he died in his cabin uh, on the cruise ship, you know. And uh, yeah. Andrew goes, he's sick. I went in there and I went, oh my God. Yeah, he's on, he's like this, but he was all dressed up. He had velvet pants on. He had his chains on. <laughs> I said, only Jimmy would pass on that looking like a, a rock star. You know, God bless him. He, he sort of went uh, in his terms and he wasn't feeling well. Andrew tells the story. Uh, he's been on the show and he talks about sort of the discovery of this uh, and, and that. He wasn't feeling well, but he, I think maybe he, and he turned out he was very sick later, they found yeah. that uh, maybe he was going out playing rock and trying to do what he did best. Well, we, he told us he had pneumonia. So we, we, you know, he didn't have any money. He, Jimmy had money, no money, right? one of these things, you know? So we gave him money to pay for the doctor visits and stuff. And he said he had pneumonia and he was all gray. Mm-hmm. Uh, he made it to Florida from California. I played the gig. And uh, then he passed on on the boat, and we found out eventually it was lung cancer. But yet two days before, he's smoking a cigarette out in the hotel, out front of the hotel. <laughs> That's what I mean. Jimmy wasn't one to wind up going to chemo and going through that whole thing to, to, to try to fix it and being in a hospital. He, he didn't go through that. He rocked out to the end. Like, yeah, oh, and uh, I always tell people if you're out in California, you can go visit uh, Jimmy's final resting place. He's uh, sort of between uh, Ronnie, James Dio, and Lemmy. Right. So uh, yeah, they're around the corner. Yeah, it's in one it's area. Definitely a place for for to revisit some rock and, and roll and memories. Li- Liberace. That's right. Liberace is not very far as well. Liberace is across uh, across there, and the guy uh, who did the James Bond movies, uh, Broccoli. Yeah. Albert yeah. Broccoli. He's it's like the Beverly Hills of the cemetery. Oh, it's yeah. oh, it's very elite, and they've added Carrie Fisher yeah. and Debbie Reynolds now, and it's a ah. it's 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 prime real estate, you know. If you're going, <laughs> yeah. If, if you're hopefully they're all partying together somewhere. I I, I think that would be the best uh, uh, scenario possible. So um, so last in line continues. We'll get into music. Um, we're going to link everything because you got a lot going on luckily you stay busy and uh, and we'll link that so people can can tune in listen and they should watch uh i recommend if you're a, if you're a drummer absolutely but even if you're just a fan of music and you want to see how things are done every tuesday yeah. night behind the kit 
on yeah, Tuesday, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time on Facebook. Right, on uh, Facebook. V Vinny Apathy Official. That's yeah, it. and then uh, Thursday's Hanging and Banging with your brother, which is sort of a podcast talk show yeah. um, where you guys have people yeah, come Yeah, tonight in. we got Andy Freeman on and um, the drummer from uh, Effescence. Evescence? Evanescence? Evanescence, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah, I can't pronounce those ones. The, I, I, this, I get it. Too yeah. many letters in it. <laughs> but what a great band. I love that. Love that band. Yeah. And so that'll be a fun stuff. show that people. So I got to run. I got to go pick up my car. We got hanging and bang in 45 minutes. Yes. So. The, you're you're yeah. spending your life online. I appreciate it so much, Vinny. What a pleasure. It's always great to see Thank you. You're you. such a nice guy, a classy guy. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. And we'll keep in touch, Jason. Good luck with Absolutely. the show. Absolutely. Thank too. you so much. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening and uh, not blowing your ears out with all this crazy music. <laughs> Crank it up.